Inside this seemingly simple thing, a mass swinging on a string, lies a trove of unexpected geometry and secrets to be uncovered. So today, let's dig up that long-lost Physics 101 knowledge and wander through the world of oscillations with me. But before we get ahead of ourselves, we'll choose to start with a classic approach and define a couple variables. For example, we can talk about the angle of the pendulum bob, theta, the length of the string, L, and the mass of the bob, M. This time, we'll bypass the traditional free body diagrams in favor of energy methods and see where that leads. We can find the kinetic energy of the pendulum using the iconic formula 1 half mv squared. To find the tangential velocity v of the pendulum, remember that it's just the angular velocity times the radius of rotation. Angular velocity is how fast the angle changes over time, so naturally it's just the derivative of theta, which we can denote theta dot. So, the kinetic energy of the bob is just 1 half m l squared theta dot squared. To look at the potential energy of the system, let's arbitrarily set the ceiling as the point of zero potential energy. You can place the zero point wherever your heart desires, as long as you're consistent, because ultimately, we only care about differences and in turn derivatives of potential energy functions. When you move up, away from the center of the Earth, we know you should gain some gravitational potential energy. In turn, as you drop down, then you should lose gravitational potential energy. Taking this into account, we can then say that the gravitational potential energy, or just GPE, of the bob equals minus mgy. This vertical distance y could also be described in terms of the angle of the bob and the length of the string, using some quick trig, leading to this expression for the potential energy. Keeping things simple, then if we add these two parts together, we can come up with this function, which gives the total energy of the system as a function of its position and velocity. This function is just begging to be plotted, so let's plot the energy as a function of both theta and theta dot. Slowly, this curvy and undulating purple surface materializes. We could now, ignoring the discussion of conservative and non-conservative forces, remember energy conservation and assume that dE dt equals zero. In other words, the energy of the system is a constant for all time, as long as we don't meddle with the pendulum. This means that we can return to the plot and ponder, what does it mean to look at level sets of this energy function? For each particular choice of energy, the red curves represent the allowed states of the system as it evolves through time. Think about why this should be the case, considering how the combination of constraints that we placed gives rise to these interesting curves. We could plot the red solution curves in phase space, a space in which each point represents a unique state of the system. Jumping into phase space can be a useful way to paint a sort of portrait of how a system changes as time passes. If we zoom in close to the center of the plot, where the range of theta is very small, things look suspiciously circular. If we pull back the pendulum some amount theta naught, the motion of the green point along the solution curve represents how the system evolves through time. If we entertain this idea further and approximate this particular solution as a perfect circle, then we can find the position and angular velocity of the bob at any time by just projecting onto the position and velocity axes. If this angle in phase space evolves linearly with time, then we should expect trigonometric dependencies for theta and theta dot from this geometrical model. Of course, we can't be certain that the angle behaves like this at this point, but it does appear to be the case at first glance. I know many of you will now be squirming with the lack of rigor I offered as we traverse this terrain of our purple plot. So just for you, let's shift to a more abstracted but rigorous approach. Let's jump back to energy conservation. Throwing in our energy function, we can take the derivative like this. Take care to remember the chain rule and the fact that the derivative of theta dot is theta double dot, which is what we'll use to call the angular acceleration. A little algebra, and we land squarely here. 
an equation which happens to be a non-linear second-order differential equation. This calls for a physics power move, or really just an approximation. Do you remember the Taylor expansion from high school calc? All it really says is that we can approximate functions around some range that we care about using an infinite series of polynomials. Notice that if I plot sine like this, and on top of it plot increasingly higher order approximations, I slowly start to approach the original function. If we focus on a very small range of x, then sine of x is actually pretty close to x. Even at a solid 20-30 degrees, the error between the function and this first order approximation is pretty small. With this in hand, let's substitute sine theta with theta, with a small caveat, and come to a differential equation we can actually solve. Here, the classic trigonometric functions sine or cosine fit the job description pretty well. For example, if we take the derivative of sine twice, we land at the negative of what we started. To encompass a broader range of solutions, we could use a more general form of a sine wave. Each of the parameters will let us modify the solution slightly to suit our needs. A represents the amplitude, or how far the pendulum swings out at its peak, and this lets us stretch out the solution to accommodate a wide range of maximum displacements. The parameter omega represents the so-called angular frequency, which encodes how long it takes for each oscillation to occur. Finally, this phase factor phi lets us shift the curve to start at any point in the pendulum swing. Does this general form work with our equation? We could check and start by taking one derivative. Remember the chain rule. Then take the derivative one more time, getting us to this form. Plugging this back into the original equation tells us that apparently this generalized sine wave is actually a valid solution, as long as omega is equal to the square root of g over l. And so we have a solution, and it even happens to be unique. If we want, we can find the necessary values for a and phi to fully define the motion using a set of two initial conditions. Lastly, let's take a second to tease out a little more info on how long it takes for the pendulum to swing. Earlier, we found that omega must equal the square root of g over l for our solution to be valid. So let's call back our definition of angular frequency. In here, we could substitute the square root of g over l, do a little bit of algebra, some rearrangement, to find that the period of the pendulum is just 2 pi times the square root of l over g. So the time it takes to complete one full swing is proportional to the square root of the string length, but surprisingly, is independent of the mass. Think about how you might try to test this. In the meantime, for an animated demonstration, let's build two pendulums, where one has four times the length of the other. It's not too hard to deduce that the period of the second pendulum should be twice that of the first. So we can set up these pendulums, pull them back, and see how this would play out. The way that the peak amplitudes perfectly line up at certain moments hints towards the discussion of harmonics and the math behind sound and music, but that's a discussion for another time. As we call it a day on this trek into the study of undulations, let's recap what we did. In the first half, we took a visual approach to see how our energy function suggests a particular behavior of the pendulum. Then, we dove headfirst into the symbols to see that the math seems to give a result which agrees with the geometry. The pendulum swing should be approximately sinusoidal. Individually, each model is helpful, but together they make each other more powerful, hopefully giving you some more intuition on the secrets of this seemingly simple thing, a mass swinging on a string. If you made it this far, thanks so much for watching. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe to Quenna and Tour. Big thanks to my friend Matthew for making the amazing soundtrack to this video. 
I think it really adds to the atmosphere and fits with the mood that I'm going for. This was my first time doing animation, and drawing it by hand was kind of time consuming, but also very satisfying to see the end result. If you're interested in art, then be sure to check me out at Left Handed Limasan on Instagram and TikTok, where I post lots of videos of the printmaking process, and the Left Handed Limasan YouTube channel, where I hope to post a new video very shortly. As for this channel, I don't know how much time I'll have in the fall, but if you guys are interested in seeing more of this type of content, then let me know in the comments and maybe we'll make it happen. That's all from me, and I'll see you later.